up, have a conversation, try and get them talking to each other and to all of you, um, and have this an opportunity for us to really dig into some of the hard uh, issues that are relating to drones. Um, so I'm just going to start off by giving a very brief introduction to each of our panelists here. Um, I could go on at great length about their expertise, but that would take up the better part of our two hours. So I'm going to keep it very brief. Uh, first, we have Professor James Cavallaro. Uh, who is a founding director of Stanford Law School's International Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic. Uh, and he uh, has dedicated his career to human rights issues in both his scholarly work and his legal practice. He has been a clinical professor of law and executive director of the Harvard Law School Human Rights Program uh, before he joined Stanford Law School's faculty in 2011. He recently conducted a study on the effects of the use of drones on civilians in Pakistan called Living Under Drones. Uh, he received his uh, BA from Harvard, uh, which is uh, something we have in common, and his JD from UC uh, uh, Berkeley, uh, where I taught for a year, uh, which uh, is uh, near and dear to my own heart. So uh, welcome. Uh, second, uh, we have Professor Gabor Rona, uh, who is the International Legal Director of Human Rights First. Uh, he advises Human Rights First programs and questions of international law and coordinates international human rights litigation. Uh, before he came to Human Rights First, he was a legal advisor at the legal division of the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, which uh, many of you may know has been very active on these issues, one of the few organizations that really provides detailed information on international humanitarian law. Um, at the ICRC, he focused on the application of international humanitarian law and human rights law in the context of counterterrorism policies and practices. He's taught international humanitarian law and international criminal law in several academic settings, including the International Institute of Human Rights in Strasbourg uh, and, uh, and at the University Center for International Human Humanitarian Law in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, and he's now an adjunct professor at Columbia Law School. Um, uh, speaking third uh, is Professor Matt Waxman, uh, who's an expert in national security law and international law, specializing in domestic and international legal aspects of combating terrorism and the use of military force. He holds a JD from this institution, uh, and he clerked for Associate Supreme Court Justice David Souter and Judge Joel Flom of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. Before joining Columbia uh, faculty, he served in senior positions at the U.S. State Department in the um, Office of Policy Planning there. Um, he was at the Department of Defense and National Security Council as well. Um, he was a Fulbright Scholar to the U.K., uh, where he studied international relations, and he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Bruce Fine, uh, who uh, was the Associate Deputy Attorney General and General Counsel to the Federal Communications Commission under President Ronald Reagan. He served as Research Director for Republicans on the Joint Congressional Committee on Covert Arms Sales to Iran and on the American Bar Association's Committee on Presidential Signing Statements. He has been a visiting fellow for constitutional studies at the Heritage Foundation and an adjunct scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, he is regularly called to testify for House and Senate Judiciary and Foreign Relations Committees, and he's a founding member of Bruce Fine and Associates, uh, a law corporation, and is the principal of public advocacy of the, of, a, of the public advocacy organization Litchfield Group, and he's currently serving as senior policy advisor to the Ron Paul 2012 presidential campaign. It's or, over. Is that still happening? Uh, I was going to say, this is on my, on my information, I'm thinking, I'm not so sure that's still happening, was serving uh, as the advisor to the campaign, uh, which must have been an interesting uh, experience and maybe uh, will come up today. So we're so happy to have uh, these experts with us here today. As I said, they're going to speak briefly to get us started. Um, and then we hope to open it up to robust conversation, both up here and with all of you. So please get your, uh, your questions ready, because we're going to turn it over to you as soon as we can. All right, thank you. OK. So uh, thank you for the introduction. And I'd like to thank the organizers. I'm going to some detail about uh, how thankful I am for your organization and your, and, your, uh, and your helping to arrange to get me out here, et cetera. But I only have seven or eight minutes, so I'm going to cut straight to the chase. Uh, the topic that we're charged with addressing is thinking about drone warfare. And I'd like to start by suggesting that the debates that we've seen in, I would say, uh, mainstream media and elsewhere in the legal academy uh, have largely been misguided 
and have largely failed to question and to examine the difficult issues that we should be examining. So th that's where I'm going to, that's where I hope to take us, uh, in part because most debates are won and lost in the framing. Uh, and I think we've been losing the debate about drones because we've lost the debate about framing. Uh, let me provide some context first. Uh, I started working on drones uh, with the clinic at Stanford at the end of 2011. And in very summary form, at that time, the dominant narrative in the United States was that drones were remarkably precise, that they only killed terrorists, that they had, uh, they, they produced no collateral damage and no civilians or almost no civilians. And we were receiving information from contacts and civil society groups in Pakistan that questioned that narrative. And uh, we decided uh, to undertake a project, which we began, and then we, we brought in colleagues at NYU. And together, uh, we traveled uh, several times to Pakistan and, and uh, interviewed 130 people in Pakistan, including 70 people from North Waziristan, uh, the area most directly affected uh, by drone strikes. And what we were able to document by going to the source, and this was, I think, really sort of uh, at the time, this hadn't been done by uh, Western uh, research institutions or rights groups. Uh, by going and talking to a significant number of people directly affected, uh, we were able to demonstrate uh, that the dominant narrative uh, was false along many dimensions. So I'll just flag the, the main ones. Uh, one, the civilian casualties were significant. Many civilians were dying in drone strikes. Uh, second, those who were being killed, the overwhelming majority were not, still are not, high value terrorist suspects. Uh, the data we have, and this has been confirmed again, was that something on the order of 2% or less of those killed in drone strikes were high value t terrorist suspects. So the others are either low level militants or civilians. Uh, Third, that signature strikes were, were being widely used, although that uh, program is still shrouded in, in secrecy with uh, uh, terrible uh, numbers of, of killed. And uh, something else that we, we highlighted was that there is a significant cost to communities and then also politically as well from the constant presence of drones. And one of the things that really struck us is people told us about what it's like to live with drones hovering overhead 24 hours a day, never knowing when they're going to strike, who they're going to strike, and how that affects daily life, and how that also promotes, <coughs> excuse me, the development of particular political views uh, that might be dangerous to the interests of the United States. So we released a report in, in the fall of 2012, and we faced a, a significant degree of pushback about our conclusions, more than I would say about almost any other report I've worked on and I've been doing human rights reporting for uh, 20 plus years. Uh, we still face some pushback, but that said, over the last six months, seven months, pretty much every one of those conclusions that we reached has been ratified by a number of sources. And, and sources that I think uh, stand up to, to scrutiny. Uh, most recently, Lindsey Graham, uh, the Marxist subversive senator from, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, who I think we can trust on this, uh, indicated the number of uh, killed due to drone strikes was on the order of 4,700, which comports with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which is the data source that we sent our report in Columbia, has also sent a report, is the most reliable uh, source for a number of reasons, which I could get into on Q&A. Uh, there's also been ratification of the idea that high value terrorist suspects are a very, very small minority. Uh, Jonathan Landay's piece, the McClatchy reporter, looks at a universe from 2010 to 2011, 482 killed, uh, only six high-value target terrorists, which means that something on the order of 98 to 99 percent are either low-value, uh, uh, low-level militants, or civilians. Uh, the importance of signature strikes uh, has been uh, uh, confirmed in, in other sources, and also the fact that not all of these strikes can be justified or explained as responses to imminent threats. Mark Mazzetti's uh, book, The Way of the Knife, and also the reporting on it in The Times and elsewhere makes clear that the first major strike, the first strike uh, against Nek Mohammed, was a side payment or an arrangement where the United States 
killed some of the Pakistanis wanted killed in exchange for the authorization to then continue to kill others. Uh, so uh, there's been confirmation. There's been confirmation on a number of the policy arguments as well. Voices are in increasingly uh, recognizing the blowback and the negative consequences of drone policy uh, for U.S. interests, whatever it means to people on the ground in Pakistan. Uh, and I can go into that in Q&A also. What I wanted to address, and by my tell, I've got about four more minutes to try and stay in seven. Maybe I'll go up to uh, uh, five and, or six, but I'll stay under ten. Uh, the debate is clearly better than it was uh, at the end of 2011, early 2012, but I think we're still missing the main points. And uh, to, to give you a sense of how and why we're missing the main points in very summary po uh, form, uh, I'll just run through where the debate has been. Uh, for years, the CIA, uh, the Pentagon, uh, White House denied the existence of the program. And so we, civil society, media, et cetera, responded by trying to establish, yes, there is a program and there are drones and, and, and they're, they're provoking the, these consequences. Uh, then for years, the CIA released unbelievably low numbers, unbelievable in that they should not be believed, uh, low numbers. And uh, therefore, we responded by pushing back and saying, no, the numbers are, are here. Uh, then uh, the Times revealed, revealed by interviewing three dozen uh, high-level officials, uh, that there was a kill list. And the kill list operated in a particular way, and there are Terror Tuesdays, and here are the, uh, the means by which individuals are targeted, and so we debated the kill list. Uh, then there's a, a white paper which is about uh, the killing, whether and under what circumstances the U.S. could target and kill a U.S. citizen who is a high-value terrorist suspect plotting dangerous, imminent threats. So we, deba we debated that issue. And Rand Paul since we, uh, you know, stood up on the floor of, 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 of uh, uh, the Senate and, and, and for 12 hours or 13 hours uh, demanded a response about whether a U.S. national could be killed, sort of taking the, the, the white paper and running with that. Uh, and throughout one of, the, one of the demands of civil society, one of the issues that has come up and has been questioned by the media is transparency. And that has led us to a debate which now is taking us to should drone strikes be controlled by the CIA or by the Pentagon? And in all of those debates, as important as many of those issues are, the rights of U.S. citizens not to be killed, important. I'm, I've got a U.S. passport. I don't want to be targeted by a drone strike. Important, and we should debate it, and it says a lot about us as a polity and as a people and, a, and a, a, about what the Constitution means, et cetera. But I, we continue to miss the main issues. Uh, here's why. One, high-value terrorists, and I've said this already, less than 2%, which means that probably, although we can't know this for certain, the vast majority of strikes are signature strikes. We have no idea what the criteria are for signature strikes. Uh, we should be very worried about signature strikes because th we haven't addressed uh, their legality. What we've done, in effect, I think, is allowed ourselves to be distracted by an argument about a minuscule portion of what's being done as though that we're a proxy for the entire program. And I would say it's akin to the debate in torture about the ticking time bomb. The high-value terrorist somewhere in the mountains of North Waziristan who may conceivably be directing a nuclear warhead at Washington. That imaginary case, imaginary, I'll underscore that 14 times, imaginary case has been driving a debate. That's not what's happening. What's happening is that uh, folks who look like they might be militants on a, on a, a video screen are being killed in, in large numbers. And it's similar to the torture debate where Ticking time bomb, let's address that. Anyone who knows anything about torture or has worked in societies or research or documented places, say in uh, Guantanamo or other detention centers where torture occurs, know that that is an infinitesimally small percentage that may well be zero. But when it drives the debate, it warps the debate. So we have to move away from that debate. Uh, second, I think transparency is important, but I think we've spent too much time on transparency. I'll, I'll just put as a footnote, None of the people that I spoke with in Pakistan who'd lost fathers, who'd lost other relatives, who had been maimed themselves, none of them asked me as an ambassador, so to speak, of the United States, can you please struggle and fight to make sure that the norms uh, explaining why and justifying why we're, drones are being fired down on our communities are occurring? We really want to know the legal standards. Didn't hear that once, okay? Uh, so transparency is important, but what we want to have is legality. Uh, and then I think we want to 
be ahead of the curve. We should be thinking about accountability, an accountability for the strikes that have occurred. We're not very good at accountability in, in this country, but I think we need to have a debate about accountability. Uh, and then we also need to, in thinking about drones, we need to think about what should the law look like. One of the issues that occurs in international law, unfortunately, when the United States is involved, is that the United States takes actions and produces legal memoranda uh, and arguments that move international law in directions that are consistent with U.S. policy or convenient for U.S. policymakers. That's what the United States does. By the way, I think it's what other countries do. I don't, I'm not ascribing a particular evil motive to the United States. I think Burkina Faso would probably do this too if it had the wherewithal then to take actions consistent with that. The United States has the wherewithal. It's the lone global superpower. So international law tends to be a moving target. And uh, we tend to be behind the curve by engaging with State Department and their proxies on what uh, the law is. We should get ahead of the curve on what the law should be. And let me just end with an analogy. And I'll, I'll do this because I think I have about 30 seconds. Uh, I'm going to get another sheet of paper, but I will stay within my 30 seconds, I promise. Uh, and that is some people uh, will say, oh, you know, the, the cat's out of the bag with drones. The United States has been using them. They've killed many people with drones. They have a drone policy. So we can't change this. We can't legislate either na nationally, domestically, or internationally. And I would say that, that that's simply not the case. And the example I would use would be chemical and biological war, uh, weapons, which were used massively in World War I, which killed tens of thousands of people in horrific ways, and which afterwards were legislated against in 1925 and then beyond with subsequent treaties in, in a way that I would say has been reasonably reasonably successful, and we see in real time how the possible use of chemical and biological weapons may be uh, the downfall uh, in Syria. So it's not too late for us to think about what should be the norms on weaponized drones, and it's not too late for us to move away from the restrictive debate about law to the law about ethics and justice and righteousness and who we are as a people and what sort of world we want to live in. Thank you. Uh, and I want to start with um, three or four propositions. Uh, one is that there's nothing inherently unlawful about using drones. Two is there's nothing inherently unlawful about targeted killing per se. In, in an armed conflict, the alternative to targeted killing isn't no killing, it's indiscriminate killing, and that's a war crime. And there's nothing inherently wrong in the concept of what you heard Jim talk about as signature strikes. That is, we don't know who the person is, we just know that they're, they're doing certain things or we have a, a certain degree of, uh, of satisfaction that they're doing certain things that we attribute to bad guys or, or terrorists. And that may be also particularly uh, uh, questionable in terms of what the evidence is that we're using, but there's nothing inherently wrong with targeting someone on the basis of evidence that, say, doesn't include knowing who their names are, but um, knows what they're doing. Um, from these few points, you might conclude that I'm a big fan of drone strikes. <coughs> but in fact, I agree with everything that Jim said. And the reason has to do with the particulars of international law as they should be applied as opposed to how they are being applied by the United States. There are two major frames of international law that can apply here, and they can overlap. One is the law of armed conflict. The other is the law of human rights. Now, in a war, targeting and killing are lawful. But before you can say that you have an armed conflict to which the laws of war are applicable, certain conditions have to be met. And it is in the meeting of those conditions that I think the United States is taking great liberties with its targeting claimed authority. One is that to have an armed conflict, you have to have parties. You can't just have bad guys. You can't just have militants. You can't just have terrorists. You can't just have insurgents. You have to have parties to an armed conflict. Those parties are defined in accordance with their capability of utilizing and having a command structure through which the laws of armed conflict may be 
determined, may be implemented. And if an entity is not sufficiently formulated so that it doesn't have a command structure, it doesn't have a hierarchy, it doesn't have the capacity, whether it wants to or not, to comply with the laws of armed conflict, then it isn't a party to an armed conflict. And it may very well have been that on September 12, 2001, there existed an entity called Al-Qaeda, which could be determined to be a party to an armed conflict, but whether or not such an entity exists today is highly questionable. Second, in order to have armed conflict, even once you have parties determined, you have to have a certain threshold of hostilities that are taking place over time. If you don't, then it is merely domestic and criminal law mechanisms that apply. If we didn't have that threshold requirement, <coughs> then there simply would be no ability to distinguish between when killing is allowed in a rather promiscuous way that the laws of armed conflict allow it uh, to, to exist, and the more limited ways in which killing extrajudicially is allowed in a criminal justice framework. We cannot cross those barriers willy-nilly. So although I have no problem with drones per se, I have no problem with targeting, targeted killing per se in armed conflict, there's a great deal to be discussed, debated, and as Jim said, one of the things that has simply not appeared in the debate, as important as it is, is this question of whether or not we ever were, and even if so, are we still in an armed conflict with the people who are the victims of targeted killing? Second, even if we do have an armed conflict, even if the context is one of war, the laws of armed conflict don't allow you to kill anybody and everybody. The most fundamental principle of the law of armed conflict is that of distinction. Distinction between what? Well, between combatants and civilians. And that's easy enough to determine when you've got Army A lined up against Army B on the beaches of Normandy. You know who's who, you, you, and, and you don't have to worry so much about distinguishing between civilians and combatants. But the kinds of warfare that take place today put an extra um, onus on parties to armed conflict to distinguish between combatants and civilians. And the laws of war require that if you are not sure whether someone is a fighter or not, you are to presume that they are not. The United States' criteria, what we know of it, for determining, A, that there's an armed conflict, and B, that the people that we are killing are indeed killable in the frame of, our, of that armed conflict, simply do not comport with, do not rise to the level that is required by the applicable international law. Now, what about outside of armed conflict? Because surely a police officer can kill someone who's holding a hostage, say, um, without necessarily bringing that person to a judicial officer um, and having him or her charged with a crime and, and tried and convicted. There are circumstances in which lethal force can be used, again, um, extrajudicially. In international law, there is the recognition of the right of states to use force in their international relations when they are faced with an imminent threat. The concept of imminence is the key to the determination of when and against whom a state can use force in its international relations. Today, what we're seeing is a redefinition, a redescription down to just about zero of the concept of imminence by those who have spoken on behalf of the United States on this issue, such that we no longer have to have a recognized threat. We no longer have to have uh, an existing attack. We no longer even have to have a recognition of a particular individual posing a particular danger that could result in lethal consequences to the United States or Americans. What we've had, for example, from Attorney General Holder 
is a statement that, well, we have to rejigger the concept of imminence to deal with the potentiality of the great threat of terrorism, and that potentiality requires us to not only look at how likely the threat is to manifest itself, but whether or not, say, we would miss a window of opportunity to take someone out who might do some harm to us in the future. Using that kind of standard to determine when and where individuals can be killed through the use of American force in international relations is disastrous. It's disastrous because it's wrong. It's disastrous because the United States, as Jim said also correctly, I think, sets an example by which other countries will determine their own interpretations of international law. These things have real consequences beyond the consequence to the individual that is being targeted. And also, I think, as found by many of the studies that have been done about the effects on the ground of targeted killings and drone strikes, there is the very legitimate question of whether or not these tactics create more enemies than they take out. So from the perspective of international law, forget policy considerations for a moment, while there's nothing inherently wrong with drones, while there's nothing inherently wrong with targeted killing, there's nothing inherently wrong with killing people even though you don't know what their names are, in other words, signature strikes, there is a great deal wrong with the present um, manifestation of U.S. targeted killing policy. And this is the reason why those of us who are doing advocacy in this realm are fighting so hard, first and foremost, for increased government transparency. Because we, at least as Americans, or I should say for anyone that purports to live in a democracy, have the right to know who our government is killing in our name, especially when they're doing it extrajudicially. The next frontier in this debate is going to be the one in Congress about whether or not we need a new authorization for the use of military force. After 9-11, the Bush administration asked Congress for authorization to use military force against terrorist threats rather generically. And Congress, even in the minutes or days after 9-11, said, no, we don't think so. We'll give you an authorization for the use of military force, but we're going to limit it to the Taliban, to Al-Qaeda, to those who have harbored the individuals that are responsible for the 9-11 attacks. What's happening now is a debate saying that, well, the old AUMF is kind of uh, long in the tooth. It needs to be um, revisited, and the threats are expanding. Therefore, we need a new AUMF that doesn't limit us to targeting Taliban and Al-Qaeda, but to targeting terrorist threats more generally. This is an extremely dangerous idea, but this is going to be the next step and the next focal point of the debate in which the question of the, the breadth of both targeting and detention will take place in the United States. And to the extent that authorizations for the use of military force either continue as is or, what is even more concerning, would be expanded to encompass threats that aren't defined by the name al-Qaeda, Taliban, but say more generally what are considered to be terrorist threats in Somalia, uh, in Mali, and elsewhere, unnamed threats, that is the extent to which the United States is walking very deliberately down the road to perpetual war. And that, I think, would be a great mistake.